Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have today to sing your praises. We do thank you for sending Jesus, your son. We thank you for sending him to take on flesh. The humility just blows our minds to think that you would make a way for sinners to be right with you. We thank you, Lord, for your word that instructs us, that teaches us, that rebukes us and corrects us, that encourages us. And Lord, we thank you for your spirit that guides us into truth. We ask for your help this morning, that your word would go forth with power, that according to your promises, that it would not return void, but that we would be changed, that we would be made more like Christ for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In thinking through the Christmas season and considering what to preach, I was struck by the battle that arises in our hearts during this time of year to make Christmas about Christ. Between the decorations, the melodies, the activities, the shopping, and the sweets, we tend to leave the crumbs for Christ. Where we spend our time often reveals what we treasure most And at an even deeper level, how we respond when those things are taken away or when they don't go as planned, it exposes what is most important to us. And although there are many passages that speak about the supremacy of Christ, the worth of Christ, the greatness of Christ, in God's providence, one of the most powerful statements Paul makes about who Christ is happens to be in the very next section in our sermon series through the book of Philippians. So please open your Bibles with me to the book of Philippians. This short personal letter is all about joyfully serving Christ. We've seen this in the initial greeting, in the opening prayer, and then again in the first portion of the missionary update that Paul began back in verse 12 of chapter 1. Paul just told the Philippians how despite personal imprisonment and personal slander, The gospel of Christ was advancing, and in that, he rejoiced. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus is Lord, and that through his death and resurrection, sinners can be made righteous before their creator and enjoy him forever. The mission was more important to Paul than his comfort or his reputation, more significant than how he feels about his circumstances and how others perceived him. And to evidence this priority, Paul says in verse 18, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. The joy of the servant of Christ was rooted in the advancement of Christ. But Paul doesn't stop there. He proceeds to declare with certainty, yes, and I will rejoice In contrast to his present rejoicing in the advancement of Christ, Paul draws his audience's attention to the ongoing aspect of joy in the life of a servant of Christ. Paul wants the Philippian church to see the deeper underlying truths that secure, that cement Christian joy. What Paul shows us in this simple statement of, yes, and I will rejoice, is that faithful servants of Christ will confidently rejoice in Christ. And in the following verses, he explains this powerful and unexpected statement. Maybe this morning you are wondering, how can I have confident joy as a servant of Christ? On what basis can I confidently rejoice amid my suffering? How can Christians today confidently rejoice when the immediate future appears uncertain. What we find in our text are three reasons why faithful servants of Christ will confidently rejoice in Christ. First, let's look in verse 19. Here we find the first reason that Christ confidently rejoices is because Christ will deliver his people. Paul continues, For I know that through your prayers, And the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. We know that Paul is explaining his reasoning for confident joy because he says the word for. As if to say, I will rejoice for this reason. 
But why can Paul be resolute in rejoicing? It's because he knows how the story ends. Notice the confidence of Paul. He says, I will rejoice for I know, meaning certainty, that this will turn out. There is no question in Paul's mind about the ultimate end result. He knows the outcome will be, he says, my deliverance, or some translations say, my salvation. Paul is quoting from Job 13, 16, where Job says, this will be my salvation. If you recall Job's context, he's experiencing suffering according to God's sovereign plan, and even being told by his so-called friends that it was his fault. As we saw last time in verses 12 through 18, Paul's experiencing suffering according to God's plan, and even being told by other believers that this is all his fault that he's in prison. That is exactly what Paul has in mind when he says the word this, that this is his circumstances and that it will turn out for his deliverance. God was at work through Paul's circumstances to bring about both Paul's good and God's glory. That is the deliverance that Paul had in mind. And Paul is living out what he wrote in his letter to the Roman church. In Romans 8, 28, he wrote, and we know That for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. But not only was Paul sure of the end, but he was also certain about the means to that end. In verse 19 he says, Through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul mentions both the supplication of the saints and the support of the Spirit of Christ. To Paul, the prayers of these partners in the gospel were precious to him. He was confident in the request, not primarily because of who was praying, but because who they were praying to. And Paul was sure that the Holy Spirit would be with him to strengthen him amidst the persecution. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the life of the believer was foundational to Paul. Again, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9 and 10, he wrote, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Through both the petition of Christ's church and the power of Christ's Spirit, Paul is confident he would be delivered. What about you? Do you know Christ has provided the means necessary to deliver you through difficulty? Do you treasure the prayers of others on your behalf? I think sometimes we too quickly dismiss when someone says they're praying for us. In the back of our minds, we kind of pat them on the head and say, thanks, Not really going to fix my problem. Prayer is an ordained means by which God brings about his will, his plan. And they are precious to his saints. Do you believe that God, the Holy Spirit, will support you through your trial? Paul had already mentioned in verse 6 of this same chapter, saying, I am sure, confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God has given you his spirit as a seal, as a down payment of a future inheritance. He will not forsake you. He is faithful. As a believer, you ought to be confident Christ is working through your circumstances for your good and his glory. Not only does Paul confidently rejoice because Christ will deliver his people, but the second reason Paul confidently rejoices is because Christ will be honored by his servants. Paul's confidence compounds as he continues in verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life 
or by death. Paul wants them to see and us to see the desires of his heart. Paul is longing. Paul is expectant. This hope he mentions is not meant to be hope like we commonly use the word today. Hope you have a great day. Hope I passed that test that I didn't study for. Rather, this hope is a certain hope because it's a hope that is fixed on the promises of an all-powerful God who is faithful. Paul is not content here to say, well, it's out of my control. I guess whatever happens, happens. Rather, his heart is actively expecting God to work to fulfill his promises. Paul is imprisoned in Rome for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's awaiting his court date, knowing that his very life is on the line. Yet his focus is not on himself, but rather, he says, on honoring Christ. He brings up both the idea of shame and honor, that Paul would not be ashamed, instead that Christ would be honored. Paul has something in view that is larger than man's perspective. From a human point of view, Paul is already experiencing the shame and disgrace that society has to offer. But Paul says, I will not be at all ashamed Paul was dogmatic and emphatic on this point. He anticipated that through his suffering, Christ would not abandon him, but instead that Christ would be honored through him. We know this because he contrasts what will not happen with what will happen. Paul says, but with full courage now as always. We ought to recognize this morning that the fruit of Christ-centered confidence is consistent courage. We've seen over and over in just these starting verses the boldness of Paul, and now it bubbles over into consistent courage. In verse 18, he said, I will. In verse 19, I know this will turn out. And now in verse 20, he says, eager expectation and hope, and I will not, but with full courage now as always. And if someone else were to use these words, we probably would call them arrogant. But Paul is exuding confidence because his goal is this, that Christ will be honored. This is the very deliverance that Paul yearned for. It wasn't Caesar's verdict that Paul longed for. It was the opportunity to fulfill his role as a servant of Christ, to proclaim Christ for the honor of Christ. For a servant of Christ, honoring your master is your greatest goal. It is your greatest desire. And Paul expressed this in an all-encompassing purpose by the words, in my body. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 6, He similarly exhorts those fellow saints by saying, You are not your own, but you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Paul knew his master was Christ, and the greatest goal of his life was to show the greatness of his Lord, even through strife. But Paul also knew the possible outcomes He knew that this sort of full devotion to honoring Christ would either result in living or dying. Based on verse 20, both options are presented as ways in which he could honor Christ. But Paul continues famously in verse 21 to powerfully summarize how Christians should think about these two ways in which we are called to honor our Lord. Paul asserts in verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This statement is even more staccato in the original language. He says, to live, Christ, to die, gain. Paul's point is to show that for a Christian, no matter the way in which we honor Christ, we are greatly blessed 
as a result. Paul, as an inmate, chained to a Praetorian guard 24-7, says with joy in his heart, I'm in a win-win situation. First, Paul explains that living is not something he does for himself, but it is all for Christ. Paul would emphasize this idea to the church at Galatia as well when he wrote in Galatians 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is therefore no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what it means to live is Christ. It's embracing the fact that every breath I take is because of Christ and for the cause of Christ. Secondly, Paul explains that dying is not something that is a loss, but rather, for a Christian, it is great gain. Listen to the triumph of Paul as he writes at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Christ's victory is your victory when you put your trust in Christ for salvation. The perfect love of Christ at the cross casts out fear in the heart of his children. John would later write, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. For the servant of Christ who is seeking to honor Christ, there is confidence in the victory of Christ. You see, there is confidence in life because Christ has freed us from the bondage of sin and empowers us to live for him. And there is confidence in death because Christ has the keys of death and Hades. That means he has the power and authority over death and has sealed your promised eternal life with his blood at the cross. Romans chapter 8 decisively declares, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. And Romans 8 confidently concludes, For I am sure, I am persuaded, I am confident that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If Romans chapter 8 is not starred, highlighted, or underlined in your Bible, it needs to be. You need to because when the lies of Satan and the world and your flesh want to drown you in despair, you need to have confidence from God's word to know what has been accomplished for you in Jesus Christ. Friends, if I can be honest, this is one of the hardest texts to preach, not because it's complicated, but because it's very simple and straightforward. It's so clear that it actually exposes an experience with Christ that is often lacking for believers if we are being honest with ourselves. We often give into ungodly fear and ungodly cowardice. We wallow in fears of what others think about us, of being rejected or a failure, of loss of comfort or loss of dreams. But if I were to take the teeth out of this text, if I were to soften its blow, if I were to say, you know, this is just Paul's experience and we can't all be him. Or if I were to say that this sort of confidence is something that ebbs and flows, it comes and goes, and if you don't have it in your life, it's not a big deal. To do such a thing would actually be to undermine the very gospel of Jesus Christ. This boldness, this resolve is not man-made confidence. It is a confidence that is centered on the very cross of Jesus Christ. 
Your confidence in this life as a Christian is directly connected to your faith in the gospel. And we need to get this big idea this morning that your confidence in this life as a Christian is directly connected to your faith in the gospel. You must believe in the finished work of Christ if you are to have confidence as a faithful servant of Christ. Christ is honored when we live every moment for him in eager anticipation of finally getting to be with him. But Paul doesn't just leave us with this concise, powerful statement, but he takes a moment to deliberate or to dwell on the joyous results of either living or dying as a believer in Christ. Let's continue reading verses 22 and 23. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. And this aside from Paul, we are able to peek into the personal evaluation of those two real possible outcomes. Paul does not know what the result will be, which is why he even starts this section with the word if. As if to play out the scenarios to evaluate which end result is of greater value if he were able to make the choice for himself. At the level of his own desires, he is actually torn between the two options. And what we tend to do in this passage is to think that he is merely comparing living or dying. But what Paul has in mind is actually weighing the fruitful labor and being with Christ. And to the servant of Christ, both are immensely valuable. We tend to move too quickly in our evaluation of these possibilities. If I were to take a poll of the Christians in this room this morning, my guess is that in general, the younger you are, the more you value faithful, fruitful, laboring. And the older you are, the more you value departing to be with Christ. But for the personal desire of a faithful servant of Christ, Paul says, my desire is to depart, to be with Christ, for that is far, far better. Friends, this is the height of honor for Christ. We recognize this in relationships. When you are swept up in love, pursuing marriage, you are eager to serve and bless and help that spouse in any way possible but ultimately you just really, 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 really want to be with them, right? We know that. We've experienced that. Christian, how much more should our affections blaze with longing to be with our Lord Jesus Christ? We sometimes wrongly think of the phrase, to die is gain, as merely an escape from this fallen world or even our sinful flesh. But Paul here specifically states what he means. Not simply escaping sin, but enjoying his Savior face to face. Scripture teaches that every good gift comes from above, and too often we want the monetary gift rather than the marvelous giver. King David understood this rightly when he wrote in Psalm 16, 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is why Paul can confidently conclude that being with Christ is far better. But Paul recognized that his desire and will was not the determining factor. It was ultimately about honoring his Lord's will. Not only does Paul confidently rejoice because Christ will deliver his people and Christ will be honored by his servants, but the third reason for confidently rejoicing, is that Christ will be glorified through his church. Let's continue in verses 24 through 26. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. 
In verse 24, there is a significant shift in Paul's writing. Up to this point, Paul has used personal pronouns such as I, my, and me 13 times in just the last five and a half verses. I don't know about you, but my English teacher would be very disappointed. But Paul changes gears and focuses his attention on the church at Philippi. In verse 24, Paul says, this is for your account. And in verse 25, that he will continue with you all for your progress and joy. And in verse 26, so that you may glory in Christ because of my coming to you again. Paul concludes what Christ has next for him, not based on his personal desires, but based on the needs of Christ's church. We also see that Paul's confidence in his calling for Christ is fixed. That's why he says in verse 24, remaining is more necessary. And in verse 25, he says that he's convinced, even hammering it home with, I know and I will. And this isn't a a prophetic uh, inspiration, but rather a personal conviction that Paul's talking with. Even though Paul's target has changed, his ultimate aim has not. Paul ties these ideas together well in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 9, where he wrote, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. That was the desire he was just talking about. And he says, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. That is the focus of a servant of Christ, to please their master. In the verses prior to this, Paul shows us that his top priority was advancing the gospel of Christ. And the result of that in his heart was rejoicing because he knew Christ was being honored. You see, advancing the mission of Christ causes rejoicing in the servant of Christ because it glorifies Christ. And Paul's desire for the Philippian church is actually the exact same thing. Paul is working toward, he says, their progress in Christ and wants their joy in Christ so that they would have ample cause to glory in Christ. Paul was confident in his calling for Christ, whether he was in the synagogue preaching or chained to a Roman soldier or writing a letter to fellow believers hundreds of miles away. He was always looking outward for an upward goal. He was about ministering to others for the glory of Christ. This was Paul's calling. It was the calling for the Philippian believers, and it is our calling as Christians today. Are you convinced that Christ has you exactly where he wants you so that you can glorify him? We tend to respond to our circumstances in one of two ways. We think that we've messed up, and it's messed up so much that there's nothing good that can come of our situation at all. And we throw a pity party for ourselves, we mope around trying to punish ourselves, thinking that's really what we deserve anyway. This person says, I am the problem. Or another way we could respond to our circumstances is we think that we're actually the solution. If people just really listened to me, then others would understand it from my perspective and we would completely agree and everything would just be great. This person says, I'm not the problem, they are. Our true problem is we think of ourselves ultimately for the purpose of serving ourselves, not Christ. Both of these responses have the same problem. They focus on me, not the mediator. They focus on self, not the savior. They focus on how their circumstances around them might glorify them, not Christ. Christian, your heart needs to be trained by God's grace to evaluate every area of your life by this question. How might this be used to glorify Christ? How might God use this situation, my response, my actions, to glorify him? 
Sometimes this means you need to lovingly confront your spouse about habitual sin. Yikes, I don't wanna rock the boat. That seems dangerous, I don't want to cause problems. But it will glorify Christ. So live for Christ. Sometimes that means you need to confess sins to your parents that they haven't found out about yet. But that means I would get in trouble but it's glorifying to Christ. So live for Christ. Sometimes that actually means letting go of bitterness for sins that were actually committed against you. But you don't know what that person did to me. I don't, but Christ does, and he will deal with it perfectly. And he commands you to forgive, so forgive. It's glorifying to him. So live for him. When you live this way, others around you will actually see Christ. They will be able to rejoice in Christ and glorify Christ because you're not living for yourself, you're living for him. Faithful servants of Christ will confidently rejoice in Christ. Three reasons why are because Christ will deliver his people Because Christ will be honored by his servants and Christ will be glorified through his church. For Christians, the end is certain. So uncertainty is unfitting. But there may be some here this morning that have not surrendered their life to Christ. And for you, to die is loss. Because for you, to live is self You've tried to muster up self-confidence either in your own skills or intellect or determination, but you know already that you only manage to make things worse. Friend, your problem is not your circumstances, it's not your abilities, and it's definitely not your self-esteem. Your problem is that Christ is not your treasure, you are. Apart from Christ, we are all slaves to sin. We reject God because we want to be in charge of our own life. And God is righteous, and he will judge all of those who are guilty and won't let them go unpunished. And friend, you are guilty. But there is good news that God is merciful. And in an amazing act of love, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth as a man. God humbled himself to take on flesh so that he might pay for your sins and give you eternal life in his son, Jesus Christ. A life that could start today with confident rejoicing, even through trials, because of the amazing work Christ has accomplished for you at the cross. At Calvary, Christ hung on the cross and he cried out, It is finished. And the Spirit of Christ and the Church of Christ cries out today, Come, come all who desire to take of the water of life without price. God is making his appeal through his church to you this morning. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, For our sake He made Christ to be sin, the one who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you desire to be made right with God this morning, run to the Lord in prayer. God is calling you to turn away from your sin and believe in Jesus Christ. And the amazing confidence and assurance we find in Scripture is that God promises if you repent and believe, You will be saved. You will be saved. And that is the promise that we will confidently rejoice in from now through all eternity. This, friends, is the confidence of a servant of Christ. It's Christ himself. May we, by God's grace, live lives that cry aloud with Paul as confident servants of Christ, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is only gain. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we were able to have to look into your word. Your word is a mirror that often shows us our sinfulness, how we are not confident in the truth that Jesus died and paid it all. We fall prey to our flesh, to the lies of this world, that we need to aspire to be something for ourselves. We need to build our own kingdom. And Lord, it's all vanity. What we need, Lord, is to fear you. We need to trust in your promises and have confidence to be full of faith to believe that Jesus has accomplished everything we need. That every spiritual blessing is found in Christ. God, thank you for providing everything we need. Your provision is abundant and your provision is everything for us forever. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for sending him to this earth to pay for our sins, to be a sacrifice on our behalf so that we could be right with you, so that we could spend eternity with you. We ask, Lord, that you would give us grace, grace to repent of our sin and to turn in faith and trusting and relying and depending fully on you and your promises. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.